It's breathtaking. When you see sand here, imagine water. If you dive in, you can't reach the bottom. You dive in. Yes, it's called swimming. <laughs> I don't I don't believe you. In the shadows of Arrakis lie many secrets. But the darkest of them all may remain. The end of House Atreides. My father didn't believe in revenge. Okay, so the new trailer for Dune Part 2 is here, and throughout this video we're going to be going through everything in it and talking about the new characters, easter eggs, and how things relate to the book. We start off with Paul Atreides and Shaney sat on a dune, which, I promise, is the best easter egg that you're going to get. We're starting off strong, and this is an affectionate moment between the pair, in which he explains his home on Caladan and how it differs from life on Arrakis. In case you need a quick catch up on the events of the past movie then, in that we join the Atreides on Caladan which was made up of Paul, his father the Duke Leto, and his mother slash father's concubine known as Lady Jessica. Empress Shaddam IV viewed the Atreides as being a threat to his rule, and thus he gave them power over the desolate planet of Arrakis as a way to knock them down the ladder. Jessica is also part of a group known as the Bene Gesserit, who are a coven of Jedi-like nuns that have their hands in both politics and also religion. Over the millennia, they've ingested spice to imbue them with psychic-like abilities, and this gives them powers to the point that they're even able to control the gender of their child before it's born. Jessica was instructed to have a daughter, but due to her love to the Duke, she went against this and instead gave him the son that he'd always wanted. Originally, Jessica's daughter was supposed to be wed to Fade, who we end up meeting in this first look. Played by Austin Butler, the pair were going to unite the Harkonnen and Atreides house, which would avert the war and rivalry that they've had for centuries. Fade is very much Paul's doppelganger, as both are powerful sons within their own houses that will take over rule one day. If you've seen the original David Lynch movie then, this is the guy who was played by Sting, and we even see a clip of the final knife fight that the pair have in the film come the end of the teaser. I love the way that some of the scenes with him are shot, and we see them in high contrast black and white, which really makes them jump off the screen. This could potentially be a flashback that explains a character we'll talk about later on, whilst also giving us everything we need to know about Fade. Now, Butler is of course coming off the back of Elvis, and he's a great look to have in the film. Sting in that first movie, well, he was memorable, yeah, but he did just kind of stand around smirking and didn't really do much. I don't think they've hammered home enough how much he was supposed to be a dark version of Paul, but in this teaser, I, I get that idea instantly. Now, I'm going to try and stay away from spoilers as much as possible, as there are some things that will probably ruin the movie if I talk about them too much. However, we are going over things that I know the outcome of, so it's a bit difficult to dress them up as being theories when I'm well aware of what happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to avoid talking about the fates of characters, but I think... Anything beyond that, like their backstory, is stuff you can know without it ruining the movie for you, so that's what I'm just going to stick to. Anyway, we begin with Chaney and Paul discussing Caladan. Back to, back to that intro shot. Now, in the prior film, she appeared mostly in dreams, with Paul prophesizing that the pair would end up together. She's clearly taken in by Paul, and though it's just things we take for granted like water, Chaney sees them as being incredible. This makes Paul seem almost magical, even though it's very straightforward. Now this is something that's laced throughout the subtext of Dune, and even how Paul's character is portrayed. You see, Paul is also supposed to be a messiah, known as the Kwisatz Haderach. Always f*** the pronunciation of that, but to be fair, it's, it's quite a difficult thing to say. But a good way to remember it is, um, it was a Kwisatz Haderach give a dog a bone. Anyway, ruined the video there, but Paul is prophesied to be this messiah, and throughout the teaser we see the Fremen becoming swept up in this. However, that's a f***ing lie, and in case you missed the subtext in the first film, the Bene Gesserit were simply using religion to manipulate people. They felt they could control the masses by saying someone was the messiah, and that over time people would start to believe it themselves and fall in line in following him. That's why when still God sees him doing incredible things, he's caught up in the belief too, and it's also a reason why so many people follow Paul in the end. Now Cheney falls victim to it as well, and I'm sure you can guess that the pair are falling in love without me putting a spoiler warning over it. But well, that's made complicated by the voiceover we get by Florence Pugh. She's actually playing Princess Erlan, who will be acting as a sort of narrator in the movie. This ties in with the book, and almost every chapter is headed up by some narration from her, which has been carried across here. It's also how the 84 film started, with her monologuing all the backstories of the characters in the beginning. 
Irulan is the Emperor's daughter, and she somewhat acts as a way to avert the war, which I'll not spoil. See? I'm nice like that. Now whilst all this is going on, we see Lady Jessica being escorted across the desert with bright blue eyes. This shows that she's ingested a lot of spice, and I think this is taking place after the ritual she endures that turns her into a reverend mother. She has the markings on her face, and also seems similar to the vision that Paul had of her in the cave in the first movie. It's a complete opposite to how she was treated in the first film, and in that Stilgar refused to take her in at first until she demonstrated the weirding way. Here though, she's being escorted almost like she's in a royal carriage, which is shaped to look like a cocoon. Huge shout out to Thing's story for pointing out that she has a crown, and this cocoon could also be a metaphor for her upcoming rebirth. He noticed that the cocoon itself has almost snake-like skin to it, and it's possibly hinting that this is made of a worm. Anyway, in the book she ingests something called the Water of Life, which rapidly expands the minds of those that consume it. It allows one to reach across the galaxy mentally, and makes someone become almost like a god. Later on in the teaser, we see her gasping for air with her eyes open, and this comes off the back of several moments with the Bene Gesserit. Amongst these shots is Margot Fenring, who's going to be played by Leah Sado. Now She's a high-ranking member of the group, and she's also married to the Mentat Hazemir Fenring. In case you don't know, Mentats are, are basically human computers, and they often act as aids to houses. People ended up shying away from using artificial intelligence, and instead, these are people who've ingested so much spice that it makes them like math wizards. They have brains so advanced that they're almost like computers and can carry a complex calculations in seconds, which makes them very valuable. Again, lots of lore to talk about, and not much time to do it. Now, calling back to that first film, we also get a picture of the Duke Burning, which is a similar one to the Atreides' ancestor that we saw hanging up on Caladan. He was wearing a bullfighter's uniform, and as we learn in that movie, it very much tied in with their history. Now, this shows that the Harkonnens are destroying every trace of the Atreides, and that they believe they've wiped out the entire line. What if Paul Atreides were still alive? We see Irulan questioning whether Paul is still alive. This could potentially be to her father, who we know is going to be played by Christopher Walken. A Christopher Walken in Tolkien, and I think her asking if he's still alive could be her seeing if there's a way to avert the war. Spice is the most valuable asset in the universe because it allows for interstellar travel, and also because it's used as a drug. Arrakis is the only place it can be formed from, and because of this, it's very sought after. Paul and co having an army there could mean that they rise up and put an end to the Emperor's rule, so Aerolyn will probably be a key piece in the film that will try and put a peaceful end to the conflict. Seems like she's got way more agency than she did in the 84 film, which I think is probably a better way to handle things. Now among this, we get a shot of Gurney confirming that he survived the attack in the first film. I'm guessing that this movie is going to cover the major time span that the first book does due to the length of his hair at this point compared with the prior movie. Paul and co were out in the desert for years, but eventually they came across Skirney during a battle. Turned out that he'd hooked up with some smugglers, and that he'd actually ended up becoming the leader of them. Still, God was attempting to take them out. I think it, it is quite complicated. And then Paul saw Gurney on the battle, and the pair put their weapons aside. This gave Paul a much stronger army, and he's going to need it for the Harkonnens that we see in the next shot. Along with Fade, we also get Raban, who once more is played by Dave Batista. He's joined by the Baron, and judging by this shot, I think that the family's now back to ruling over Arrakis. Raban is one of the Baron's key team members, and he's someone that the Fremen clash against, which may be hinted at in the next shot. Now, we see some knife fights on both sides, clearly foreshadowing the big one that comes between Fade and Paul. Have you ever had a dream about your first ride? Don't try to impress anyone. You're brave, we all know that. Be simple, be direct. Nothing fancy. I understand. Nothing fancy. 
So yeah, I mean, now this bit's pretty straightforward, and here we catch Paul riding a sandworm for the first time. He attracts this by using a thumper, which we also saw popping up in that first movie. I think the scene is important though as it shows that he too has self-belief and that he's started to buy into this prophecy. This gives him the confidence to go above and beyond what others would and it also makes him believe that he's right. Now one of the key plot points in Dune is about how damning that prophecy can actually be. If you believe something is morally just and right, then it enables you to do terrible things. Dune eventually evolves into a story about genocide and it makes you question whether Paul was actually a good man or not because of everything that happens due to him. It's really thought provoking stuff with it showing how evil is often done in the name of good, which we know from our own histories. Several religions have murdered people en masse because they believe that they were right and doing it in the name of God which Paul also embodies. Anyway, it's a nice heroic moment so sorry for putting such a downer on it mate. It looks good and he gets to ride a giant worm, yay! Now this of course calls back to what he saw at the end of the first film and it also clearly shows the Fremen that he's special. You will never lose me, Bondrades. We gave them something to hope for. That's not hope! Thy knife chip and shatter. Now we end the teaser with several shots of the characters ramping up to this big final moment that teases at the incoming war. We get ships closing in, Fade continuing to clash in the gladiator arena, Margo watching on, and also a moment of sexual tension between the pair later on. As I mentioned though, she's known for being married to Hazmir, who will be played by Tim Blake Nelson. Now we learn in the book that she's somewhat playing both sides with things, and she's actually revealed to be a spy. I could see her possibly pretending to love Fade so that she can get info on things, and the black and white stuff being a flashback could fill in some blanks. Margot tried to warn the Atreides about the attack in the first movie, which we may see being set up here. That stuff being in black and white and then this being in colour could show that Fade suspects her and that in this moment he's questioning whether she's a spy or not. Could be wrong with that but the pair don't kiss right as we see this happening with Chaney and Paul. He promises he'll never lose her which we'll see and we also see the captured Fremen leader Shia Shackley. She's surrounded by Harkonnen soldiers and we can see on the ground that there's two dead birds. These were actually used as messengers by the Fremen and them being dead here could show that they were killed to stop communications getting out. Now we then get a sunset or, or moonset with Arrakis' sun and two of its moons almost eclipsing it. Arrakis has three moons in total and these are known as Krellin, Arvon and also One. Now we close out with Paul clearly leading a vast army and also get a tease towards that final knife fight. Now though the Fremen were thought to be small in numbers, they actually have them in the tens of thousands and it leads to Paul wielding an almost unstoppable force. We see his cloak blowing in the wind which I'm guessing is building off the back of this shot in what looks like him wandering through the desert. Paul says may thy knife shift and shatter which is something that Jamis said to him in the prior movie. It's sort of your Lawrence of Arabia story and I love how big that this trailer feels. Shot fully in IMAX, we even get the expanded aspect ratio for this teaser and every single thing about it feels like it's epic. It's an incredible new look at the upcoming movie and I was blown away by just how grand this feels. Really can't wait to sink my teeth into it and I've been going back through the book, the first movie and that 84 version to get myself back up to speed with everything. Feels like they're really going to knock it out of the park with this and we know that Dune Messiah is possibly on the horizon too. I hope that gets made as I think there's so much to love about this universe. I can't wait to see what's in store as we get down the line. Anyway, that wraps up the video. Whew, lots of things to unpack and make sure you leave your comments on it below. We are in a competition right now and giving away the Quantumania Steelbook to three subscribers on the 15th of May. And all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the teaser. We pick the comments at random on the 15th and the winners of the last one are on screen right now. So if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, guess what? We've just done a big video on the Guardians post credit scene. So head over there right after this if you've seen that movie. Lots of things to talk about, about where things can go in the future. So yeah, hopefully you watch that after this. And if not, you know what? Have a good day. I'm, I'm just going to end it nicely and you take care of yourself, mate. Peace.